<laughs> Welcome to uh, week four, I think it is, of COM 1400 slash Infosys 1609, Infosys 2609, whatever else this subject is. Thank you all for coming. We're going to jump right, <clears throat> we're going to jump right into this if my voice holds out. If I suddenly sound like my voice is breaking again, well, that'll be exciting. Um, so, before, actually, before we talk about, about this, um, a couple of announcements. So, um, I, I put up on the Comp 1400 blog that I will be doing consultations for Comp 1400 students um, this afternoon at 2. It gives me a chance to have some lunch after the lecture and then, I, um, then at 2 p.m on the ground floor of the K-17 building. So if you um, actually come over here and look for um, www. Uh, let's just go comp. There we are. Oh, and I can't get the proxy server because I have no internet. Let me plug my internet in. Do -do -do -do. Um, oh, and it's not working. Yay. Come on, you are get your act together. Thank you. Let's see if this works. That button there. Reload. Yeah, so it'll be every Tuesday at two from now on um, to the end of session. Um, and it's on the in the ground floor. So you know where the those people who are in the Comp 800 know where the Chai Lab is because you all do that. Just before you get to the Chai Lab, there are a couple of offices on your right, little consultation rooms. I'll be in one of those. I can't remember which one I've booked, but one or other of those. I still can't find the uh, internet, but never mind. We don't worry about that. Uh, we will need the internet later, so come on. Get your act together, internet. Um, cool. Well, we'll need the internet a little bit later, so hopefully it'll pick up by then. No, that's not going to be fun. Why is my internet not working? I love UniWide. Open network preferences. I must forget to, to get one thing. UniWide says it's connected, says it's authenticated, should be working. Why? Oh, I know why it's not working. It's the same thing again. Keep forgetting to do this. Network settings, no proxy. Okay. Okay, and now we try again. And this time for sure. There we go. Okay, so there's a lab up there for this week. Who exciting a lab? Um, consultation time. I believe that Claude, let's see whether Claude said anything on the other side. I believe that Claude is doing consultations for Infosys at the same time. Quiet, please. Um, oh, look, there's a fac. Oh, yeah, there you go. So he's also doing it in on level four in the level four consultation room. So if you, um, and we, and it would be best for all of us if you actually went to the appropriate one. Um, so Claude will be doing that one. I'll be doing one on the ground floor. Um, so getting back to what we were talking about. Um, so, so far we've looked at the idea of how we can have, through abstraction, we can break down um, a high-level object into a bunch of more detailed objects. And this enables us to write our code at, at varying levels of detail and to hide the implementation de details of the low-level stuff from the high-level stuff. And so the high-level classes just need to know about the public interfaces of how to use the low-level objects. And the low-level objects have their own private implementation inside. Um, so what we're talking about today is the idea of collections. Um, someone's trying to get in. Hello? No, they're gone. They gave up. They'll come in the other way. Um, the, so, so often, that's fine if we have like one object of that type. Uh, whoop, they've come back again. Hi, come in. Yeah, I know. The other doors are open. Um, so, anyway, I was saying, so that's fine if we have like one of something or if we have, you know, a fixed number of, 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 um, of fields, we can create one, two, three fields for the, the one, two, three objects that, that are, we're containing. But if we have a hundred things, we don't want to have a hundred separate fields on our object. 
Um, and if we have an unknown number of things, um, we don't, well, there's obviously no way we can spontaneously create new fields on the fly. Um, and so we need to have some way of holding a collection of objects. And there are very, the very typical case um, that happens all the time in programming is where you have one object which contains a collection of objects of the same, of all of the same type. So if you're representing a library, it would contain a collection of all the books that it has. Now, how many books are there? Well, that changes over time. So the collection increases. Um, grows and shrinks as books come and go. Um, so we couldn't just have a single field to represent every single book, partly because they, they would end up having millions of fields potentially, or at least thousands, and partly because the fields, sometimes we'd need more and sometimes we'd need less and it would just be a horrible mess to try to do that. Um, so, so we have um, what's called collections, which are ways of keeping track of multiple objects of the same type. Um, and there's some examples of what sort of applica applications, collections come up all the time. Um, Java has built in support for many kinds of collections. Um, and in fact, there we'll find that in, as you go, you'll find that there are different times you'll, will require a different kind of collection. Uh, what we're going to be talking today is mostly the first kind of these, but there are lots of different ones. So you might need a, a variable length list, um, like just a a list of objects that, that you're keeping track and maybe you can, sometimes there'll be 10 and sometimes there'll be 20 and the list will grow and shrink as you go. Um, and that list will have an order on it, so this is the first thing, this is the second thing, this is the third thing and so forth. That's one kind of collection, probably the most kind of common kind of collection you'll want to use. Sometimes you'll, have a, you'll know at the beginning how many objects you have, but you want to create a fixed size collection. So you don't want to have all this overhead of making things grow and shrink. You know you're going to have a list of four things, and so you can make a fixed size uh, array of four things. And we'll talk later about the array, probably uh, later this week, about the array type. Um, sometimes you actually explicitly want a set where you don't have duplicates on your list, you don't have any ordering, but you just know that, you know, Either this thing is in the set or it isn't, rather than having multiple copies of something on the list. Sometimes you'll even go as so far as having what's called dictionaries, where you have a, a lookup key and then a, then a result, then a, a, an associated answer. And so um, an example of a, of a, a dictionary is any time you want to have, um, well, a dictionary is an example of a dictionary. You, the key is the word that you're looking for, and the, uh, and the value is the meaning of that word, or any, any kind of thing like, uh, a phone book is another kind of dictionary where the, you look up the name and you get the associated phone number with the name. So dictionary is a little bit more complicated. That's where you start having multiple pieces of data associated together. Uh, but for the time being, we're just going to look at uh, variable length ordered lists or lists. Um, I'm just going to, when I refer to a list, I'm going to mean that it's variable length ordered list. Um, Sometimes you, the terminology gets a bit loose in this area, but usually what we mean by list is that. Um, so how do, we, how do we implement a list? Um, well, the good thing is we don't have to, um, is that it's already done for us. Java, the Java language is, is relatively small, and most of what I'll be showing you is, is parts of the Java language. But alongside the Java language is this huge thing called the Java class library, or the Java API. And then what it is is a, an enormous set of pre-written classes for you. So common classes that you will use again and again to do various kinds of applications. Somebody has already written those classes for you, and, so, um, and they've included them in the Java API. Um, by the way, API stands for Application Programming Interface but I had to look that up because I've never called it an application programming interface. I've only ever learned it as API. Um, it's, you'll find that uh, computer scientists use lots of TLAs, where a TLA is a three-letter acronym. Um, so uh, API is one of those, and, um, and I have used, the, used API so much I actually have forgotten what, what, it, what it actually stood for. Um, so an API is just the general idea of an enormous set of uh, libraries, uh, or enormous, sorry, enormous library of classes that you'll be using for your programming. Um, and the Java one is particularly huge. And we can have a look at it. And there's, um, if you go to this web page, let's see if this works. Woohoo, it works. Um, this takes us to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the API specification. Um, 
you look through here, this is an overview of all the different categories. In one of these categories, and there's an enormous number of them, we'll find the Java. A lot of these will have, you'll be totally beyond what you want to do. But one that you will want to look at is this Java util. util. These are all called packages, by the way, and we'll talk more about packages later. But the Java util package contains some classes that are useful. Um, we'll ignore all that. Blah, 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 blah. And we'll come down here where we see, nope, nope, nope. Yep, here we go. Okay, so these are, these are all the classes that, uh, that Java util uh, already defines for us. Most of them are not important to you. We can ignore the abstract ones. This, one's in, this one we're going to be looking at today, this is an array list. This represents a list of objects. Um, but there are a whole bunch of other things in here. There's a calendar class, there's currency class, there's date class, there's dictionaries. Um, so all the standard sort of things that come up in your code again and again, um, a lot of them have already been implemented in here, so you don't have to do them, do, write them yourself, which is really handy, um, especially um, because these classes are so widespread and widely used that you have pretty good confidence that they actually do what they're meant to do. Um, often you'll find in programming that, that um, you want, rather than doing something yourself, you'll go, it's much easier to find that somebody's already written it for you. And there are actually libraries out there to do all manner of things um, that you might want to do. Um, the problem is that some of them are more trustworthy than others. And so the official Java libraries are pretty trustworthy because everybody who ever programs in Java has used these classes and has made sure that they work. Um, yesterday I was trying to do some library, trying to find a Java library to do, um, to read spreadsheets. And the library that I found was a nice free one that I could download, but it turned out it wasn't very well written and, um, and stuff. And so I ended up having to, having to throw it out and write it all myself because like people, it's a programmer thing that when, you, when you've written something that's of general usefulness, um, people often will release it for other people to use. Um, programmers like making tools for other programmers to use. The problem is that some of those, pro those tools are more useful than others. Um, so one of the things you'll have to learn as a programmer is how to judge whether or not a tool is sort of of the level of reliability that you want. Anyway, these are all nicely reliable, and the one that we're interested in here today is the array list type. So we'll click on that. And this brings us up with the uh, description of array list. There's a whole bunch of information here, most of which is probably too technical for you uh, at the moment. But, um, but the important thing is that down here, it says that a bunch of, these are the summary of the public fields, constructors, and methods. And so um, we won't worry about that field because it's not very interesting. But what we're interested in is these constructors and or some of these methods. Now you can see there are an enormous number of methods um, and in fact there are more methods hidden away that we won't look at. Um, but down the bottom it gives us documentation for each one individually. And so up here we have a list of all the, all the constructors, a list of all the methods, and then if we go further down there's details on each of the constructors and details on every, every method that it provides. And it's nice this is nicely hyperlinked so that if you're interested in, um, for example, if we come down here, well, I'm scrolling, I can't do that by looking over my shoulder. If we're interested in the add method, we can click here and it'll take us straight to the add method. And then if we're interested in any of these, we can follow the links around. So the documentation is all linked to itself, which is pretty nice. Um, this is actually automatically generated document from the comments in the code. Um, which is the other reason why I'll, I'll get you to comment your code, is that you can actually uh, use a tool to turn those comments into web pages like this to document your code. But we'll talk more about that later. Anyway, so that's the ArrayList class. I'm going to look at certain parts of it in detail, but um, we'll go back to the slides before we do that. Where did I put my slides? Slides. Um, so in the Java Util package, like I said, there's a class called ArrayList, and there's a direct link to finding the docs for ArrayList if you want. Uh, this is a class that we're going to be using to represent variable length lists of objects. Um, so the ArrayList, if we saw in the, on that web page, the ArrayList had three constructors. In fact, we can go back and have a look at that. Here we are. Blah, blah, blah. Constructor summary. Three constructors. 
This, this one takes no arguments. These are all public because only public uh, constructors and methods are available for us to use. This one has no arguments. This one has an, an initial capacity. And this one has this horrible complicated thing here. But what this actually means is, um, well, so what this one does is it constructs an empty list, right? So a list with nothing in it, um, which is very easy. Um, this one constructs a list with a given capacity, but it's still an empty list. So the capacity is like reserved space for putting more things in there. Um, so if you know how big your, li your list is likely to grow, you might want to reserve some capacity. Really this is unnecessary because any, any list can grow to any size. The capacity is just there in case um, to avoid wasting time growing the list later. But um, you don't really need to know about this. Uh, almost always you'll just be creating a new, a new array list by using this constructor, the array list, empty, no parameter constructor. This second constructor is actually um, for copying another collection. So in particular, we could use this to copy one list into another list. Um, we won't be dealing with that, but somewhere along the line, you might want to actually use that one. If you have a list and you want to make a copy of that list, you can use that constructor nice, uh, as a nice way of doing it. Um, we're just going to concentrate on using this first constructor because it's the standard one that we're, we're interested in most of the time. So like I said, there are three constructors. Create one that creates an empty list, well, two that create an empty list, but one that reserves a bit more space, and this one for copying. Um, there are a whole bunch of methods. I won't go back to the web page to look at them, but um, these are the, the most sort of important ones that we're going to be dealing with. Um, the size method returns an integer which says how many things are in the list. So initially, if you create an empty list, the size is going to be zero, but as you add things to the list, it's going to grow. Um, the contains method is a, is a useful way to checking whether something is in your list. It will return, actually there's meant to be an argument to that, it will return a boolean to say true or false if something's in there. Um, the get and set methods are for getting at a particular item in that list. And I've again written that one wrong, let me edit that appropriately. Um, so get, the get method takes an index, that's better. So the get method will take an index and return us that element in the list. Um, so element 0, element 1, element 2, we can get individual elements. The set one uh, overwrites a particular element in the list. Uh, the add one adds a new element to the end of the list. And the remove one removes a particular element from the list. And we'll go through these in more detail. But let's actually try to, let's actually make an example of this because this is a bit abstruse at the moment. So here we have a library, um, it's just an empty class at the moment, let me just delete that because that's not important. An empty library class, um, we'll say a library is a collection of books, and we'll put my name here, whoops, wrong one, Malcolm, Ryan, and I keep going on about this commenting stuff, it really is important. And you'll notice in particular, at least if you're in COM1400, that the marks, a significant a quarter of your marks for your assignment are on your, on your commenting. So do make sure you spend some time getting your commenting right. Uh, August 9, 2011. Um, so we've got a library class, uh, which doesn't do anything at the moment. But we're also going to, oh, oh it's right, oh, the error's gone away. We're now also going to create a book class. And our book is going to have a couple of fields, let's say private, string, my author, private, string, my title, um, and that'll do for the moment. And we'll say public book, uh, string, author, string, title, and I'm going to, and then we can say, um, my author equals author, my title equals title. Okay, so we have a class that contains this information. Some people have asked me, by the way, whether or not, whether we can make fields public. Um, we can make fields public, and if we make a field public, then, then anyone can read and write to that field. 
Um, so any other class can read and write to that field. If it's private, only this class can read and write to that field. Um, the problem with doing that is usually reading, letting anyone read a field is fine because you can't mess things up by reading a field. Um, the problem is if you let anyone write a field, they might write values that don't make sense. Um, in particular, sometimes our fields contain information that relates to each other. Um, so, for example, um, I can't think of a good example for the book. Um, well, so, you know, if we had a... Um, if we had a private int, um, if we were going back to our ebook example and we had a private int um, my current page, right? Now, and we also had private int my number of pages. Now, valid, num valid values for the current page might be only up from, from zero up to the number of pages. Right, um, but if we made that a public field, then any other object could write whatever value they wanted into there, and so we'd, uh, if we made it public, it would be possible for other objects to put our put our our fields in an invalid state, in a state that doesn't make sense. So if we have a hundred-page book, uh, and we made that thing public, we could have people write, change the page number to a thousand or a million or whatever we want, um, and that would break our class essentially. Um, so making fields public, it, you only make fields public very, very rarely and, only on, and usually only on very simple classes that don't have a, any complicated state. Because um, otherwise you're inviting somebody to write values in that don't make sense. By controlling how people access what methods can change these things, we can control the, these values to make sure that they're always valid. So if we can only change the current page by using the methods provided by the book, then we can never set. Then we can make sure that those methods never set that value to to a, an invalid value. Um, so we almost always, and I think it'll be very, it'll probably very unlikely you'll find a case where you need to make fields public. Um, so fields private, let's, but um, but methods can be public. Methods are public if you want people to uh, outside people to use them. Anyway, getting back to what we're doing, we'd probably, if this was a real example, we'd have a lot more. Um, code on the book, but we're not going to worry about that right now. Um, what we're interested in is making the, the library have a collection of books. So um, we're going to make a private field here, and we're going to use the array list class to make a collection of books. And the syntax looks like this, array list book my books. Okay, and then we have a, um, a constructor, which is a library constructor. And we won't, we'll just start out by creating an empty my books equals new. So the same constructor syntax that we've used before, array list, and then in, in these angle brackets, and we'll talk about that in a second, book. And then, so we're using the, uh, we're using the, 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 the no parameter constructor. So we're saying initially create a uh, collection of books initially empty. Right? Um, and we'll give that a, a comment. Um, construct an empty library. Now let's add a method here. Um, public void add book and we'll say string uh, author string title. So this, this method takes, asks for an author and a title, both as, both as strings, and it's going to create a new book and add it to the collection. Uh, and so now what we're going to do is say book, book equals new book, author, comma, title. Right, so we've, we're using the book constructor to create a new book object. And now we're going to add that to the list, and we can go and we can do this: my books dot add book. Okay, let's have a look at that now. If we compile that, um, we can compile. It's got a, an error because I have done. Ah, right. Okay. 
So what it's saying is that there's an error in this line, it can't find the symbol array list. Okay? To use these things in the, in the Java library, we've got to tell it where to find them. And the way we do that is by an import statement. So we can say import java.util.arraylist. And now if we compile that, no syntax errors. All right. So the import statement has to go here at the beginning of our class, outside the beginning of the file, outside the class. So it goes before we've started the class. And it has the, the name of the package, which is Java Util, and then a dot, and then the name of the class we want to use from that package, which is ArrayList. We can import as many things as we want. If we wanted to use the java.util.random class, we could add that one, and, the, and so forth. We can make lots of imports. Um, for the time being, we only want to import the things we're using, so we're just going to import the array list. Okay, so now we have compiled that. Let's try that again. Compiled, no errors, good. And, and you see something here that BlueJ has automatically constructed that users arrow that says that the, uh, the library class uses the book class. Um, that was what we were referring to last week in the... Um, how we have these, these arrows to show the, the class hierarchy, or not the class hierarchy, the class structure. Um, so now if we create um, a library, ta-da, we have a library. If we inspect the library, we'll see here that there's an array list of books. If we inspect that array list, now this is kind of weird. This is showing us the actual internal workings of the array list. So we can't actually see the things that are in the list, unfortunately. Um, oh yeah, there, okay. Um, all right, so yeah, this is, this is where BlueJ starts to reveal the stuff that's actually private. This is the private implementation of the array list. We don't have to worry about that, how the array list actually works. All we do is worry that the fact that the array list has stuff in it. An easier way to look at this is if probably, let's see if this works. If we open up the code pad, then if we say, um, Library, let's see if this works. No, okay. Oh, I can't. Oh, oh, sorry, library one. Library one. Oh, it's an object reference, so that isn't useful either. Um, let's try this. Library one dot two string. No, that's not useful either. Oh, okay. Um, don't worry about that. Forget that I even tried to do that, and we'll hide that away. Hide our mistakes. Um, so we, anyway, we have a library, and if we, if we actually call the, oh, that's why it's doing it, because the ad, okay, silly me. Um, so if we call the add book method on that, so we need a string, let's say the string is um, who, Aristotle, and the title is poetics, it's a good book. Ta-da, we've added that book to our library. Now, we don't actually have any way of look, seeing that we've done that because we don't have any methods that allow us to look at the books in the library, which is pretty poor. Um, but, actually, let's see. Um, yeah, anyway, I'm going to keep moving on. Um, so let's add another method to our library. Let's get, it a, um, let's get a book from the library. So public, um, let's say, string get author. And then we'll say in, an integer index. Um, this says, okay, uh, my books dot get index uh, string. No, sorry, that's a book. And then say return book dot get author. And we have to add a get author method and access it to the book. So let's go over to the book. Actually, let's just do, let's not do that. Let's do this. Let's change that to get book. Get book. And that'll return a book. If you get the feeling that I'm slightly unprepared for today, you'd be right. Um, okay. So if we compile that, good, no syntax errors. Now we redo what we said. We get a new library. There we are. We add a book to that library, add book. Um, me, this, it's an exciting book, 
Um, now, if we call the get book, um, it asks us for an index. We're going to get book zero, um, and that will return. Here it returns a book, and if we look at that book, it's the book that we just added, right? So, so what we've done is create a list of objects in the thing. I'm going to actually, uh, no, I'm not. I'm going to keep going. Um, we can add, a, add another book, add book, uh, you, you wrote a book called that. And now if we get book zero, there's still the book me, this is book zero. But if we get book one, get book one is your book. So every time we add a book, we're adding it to the end of that list and we're, we're increasing the size of the list. Um, other methods we can use in there. Um, so we could also do this. We could also, for example, say public int uh, get number of books. And we can use the my book, oh, sorry, return my books dot size, which will tell us how many things are on that list, and that'll be the number of books that we have. Um, so there are a bunch of different methods there, and I'm not going to go through every single one in detail, but, um, but the methods that you're going to mostly want to use are the, um, the add method adds a thing to the end of the list, and so when we do this, we've got an extra thing on the list. The, um, the get thing gets a particular index, um, so, so if there are five things on the list, we can get things from zero up to four, and I'll go into why that is for a second. The size thing tells us how many things are on the list, so as the list grows and shrinks, that number will change. Um, you can play with this more in, in Tutes. I'm going to move it and get a feel for what all these methods do. I'm going to move on a little bit. The, um, the, we said before that a container contains, um, is a list of things of all the same type, but we need a way of telling it when we create it what type of things go in that container um, or in that collection. Um, so what we use is, call, is called a type parameter, which is this thing that we see in the angle brackets, the greater than, less than signs, after the name of the type. So um, that's, an, that's another class, which is the name of the kinds of things that go in there. The, that type will affect then the, uh, the kinds of things that go in the list, and so it will affect the type of the methods get, set, and add, because they all change depending on what type you have. So these are called generic classes. They're basically classes that take another type and their behavior depends on whatever that type parameter is. Um, so an example of what we're just doing, if we have an array of books, then we say it's an array list, and then in the angle brackets we put book, which is the type of things that are on that list. Um, if we're creating, using the constructor, we put, again put that angle brackets book in there to say that we're cr constructing a list of books. Um, when we do this, the add method will accept things of type book, and the, and the get method will return things of type book. Um, so a list of books, we, we can only add books to it, and we can only get books back from it. Um, so the type of these methods will change. If, we had, if this was a list of cars, then we would add cars and get cars back, right? So the type of the, the method changes depending on what, the list, what kind of list it is. And that type, that type is de de determined by what you put in angle brackets in the, after the name of the class. Um, this in particular, this is one case you'll come up against that doesn't work. You can't have a list of some primitive type. So Java doesn't let us have an array list of int, um, which is really annoying because often you want to store a list of numbers. Um, so if you had a high score list for a game, you want to have an array list of integers. Um, this doesn't work. Um, the problem is that the type parameter has to be a class, it can't be a primitive type. Um, and so this seems like a straightforward idea, but it, it will not work. The solution is what we, I talked about in an aside uh, last week. There's this capital I integer class. This is, this is an actual object, not a primitive type. But all it is is it just represents a single integer. And the nice thing is that integers are interchangeable. Capital I integers and little i integers and little i ints are interchangeable. Um, and so, if we make an array list of capital I integers, then we can add numbers to this in the way that we'd expect to be able to do. do. Uh, and in particular, we can add 
just a straight int, and we can get a number back and, it, and we can store it in an int variable. Um, so this is nice in that it allows us, well, it's not nice, it's a pity we have to do this. Java, um, other languages don't have this constri constraint, but Java forces us to have these two types. You, unfortunately, this is one of those sort of bad design features of Java. Other languages are much cleaner than this. You've just kind of got to remember that you can't have an, you can't use an int in a, you can't have a list of ints, you've got to have a list of big I integers. Um, so you'll probably come up against this fairly often because you often want to have lists of ints. Um, and so this is, uh, fortunately, once you know that you're using capital I integers, it all pretty much comes out neatly after that. Um, but it's just an annoying thing. It's basically what we call an object wrapper. It's an it's a object, but all that object is is just a single int inside. Um, so it's a way of treating an int as an object if we wanted to. Okay, so I said when we're getting things that we, um, that we get from zero to zero rather than getting from one. This is one of those really weird things about programming. Uh, and this is just a habit that computer programmers pe have picked up from the very early days. Um, we count, when a computer programmer starts counting, they start counting at zero. Um, so, uh, so if we had a list of four objects, they would be indexed as zero, one, two, and three. And so if we have this list of four things and we want to get item number zero, that will return the first thing, which is really, it's almost like saying it's the first thing is wrong, it's the zero thing. Um, getting object number one gets the thing at position one, getting number two gets the position at number two. Getting number four will give you an error because there aren't four things on that list. Uh, well, sorry, there isn't a fourth thing on that list. There are four things in the list, but they are numbered from zero to three. Uh, you'll get used to it. Um, I now find it weird counting when you're not counting from zero, but, um, but that's just because I've been programming for so long. Unfortunately, it's just one of those things you're going to have to remember. Um, this is almost uniform across every programming language you can name. There are only a very small number of specialized programming languages which don't start at zero. So, um, so you'll get used to this. Um, but yes, the, um, the size of this list is four because there are four things on the list. So if we ask list.size, it'll return four. But if we try to get it, those no objects are numbered ze number zero, one, two, and three. Um, how are we going on time? Okay. Okay, so, <coughs> so when we have a list of things, um, often we want to do some operation on everything in the list. Um, so if, for example, we have our library, say we wanted to print out the entire, cat the entire catalog of our library, um, we want to print the um, object zero, and then we want to print object one, and then we want to print object two, and then we want to print object three, and so forth and so on. Now, once again, this is, um, this is obviously redundant. There's a lot of redundant code here. If we wanted to change the way we were printing it, we'd have to change every single line there which again, we talked last week about how we, we try to use abstraction to avoid redundancy in our code. So rather than having the same code written many times, we try to factor it out into a method or something like that. Here, if we're doing the same, if we're, if we're doing the same operation multiple times, we'd like to factor that out so that we only have that code in there once and that we have some way of saying, do this operation four times. So that when we, uh, if we change the code, we only have to change it in one place and not in four places. Um, so we have what's called a loop statement, which allows us to do something multiple times. Of course, the most common case of this is we don't even know how many times we want to do this. If we don't know in advance how many things in our li there are in our library, we can't write uh, like a list of 100 things or 1,000 things, or we can't print out um, we can't say print book one, print book, print book zero, print book one, print book two, print book three, because we don't know when to stop writing that. But we can write a loop which loops over every book in our collection and prints every book. And the computer knows how many books there are, and so the computer knows how many times to do that loop. Um, so, so the first advantage of loops is avoiding redundancy in our code. The second advantage is it allows us to do something an, un, an arbitrary number of times where the computer knows, can, can, can calculate how many times to do it rather than, um, rather than us having to know in advance how many times it happens. Um, so there are three kinds of loops that we'll be encountering and we'll deal mostly with the first kind of these today 
and look at the other others later. So the, um, there's what's called a for each loop, which allows us to do an operation on every item in a collection. There's a while loop, which allows us to do an operation until something changes, until some condition becomes true, and or sorry, until some condition becomes false actually. Um, and then there's a for loop, which explicitly says do this this number of times. Um, So the for each loop is probably is the most common one that you use when you're dealing with collections. Um, and it looks like this. We say for, um, and then in parentheses, um, the class name, a variable name, a colon, and then the name of the collection. And then, in, and this is a, then inside the body of the for statement, uh, inside the curly braces, we do some operation on this item. And this is as far as I got with writing my slides today. So let me explain this on the board. Um, let's turn, let's turn go up. And we'll turn laptop, turn, turn to screen two. Oh, do, don't send to screen two. Don't send to screen two. Oh, ignore me. Yes, okay. Um, oh, well, whatever. It's not gonna get in the way. Can I walk this far with this? Yes, okay. So, here we go. Um, so, say we have, um, we have an array list of books um, and we'll call that the library. And let's suppose that we've done something here to initialize that. Um, what we then, to do, to do some, to print out every book on the list, actually I don't know why I'm not typing this, but anyway, for book B in uh, library. The reason why I'm not typing this is that I'm now going to grab the other pen and draw on this. So, if I found my other pen, yes, here it is. Okay. So, so we've already got a collection of books um, and we've initialized that collection and I'm not going to talk about how we do this, but what we have here, so this word for, this is a, this is a key word indicating that, that this is a for statement, a for each statement. Um, so like we have an if statement, we're now having a for statement. Um, here we have parentheses. or otherwise known as round brackets. So the thing in the side, the parentheses then, this is the name of the class. Uh, this is the, the type of the object on the list. So we have an array list of, whoops, that's not books, that's just book. An array list of book. So each element on the list is a book. So this type is the same as the type of the thing on the, on the array, in the array list. Here we have a variable name. In this case, I'm just going to call it B. Um, you often, if you're just iterating through a thing, often a short, a short variable name is appropriate. A, more, a longer variable name might be book or something like that, an appropriate thing to indicate what item we're looking at. Here is a colon. That means in. And here is the, uh, this is the name of the, name of the collection. Right. So, and then at the end of it, we have braces, and we have there, and in here, this is the body, this is the body of the loop, right? So the basic syntax is for, then in parentheses, the type of, of the things on the list, a variable name, a colon, the actual list itself, close the parentheses, and then in braces, the, op the, set of, the body is the set of operations that you want to do on that list. So let me show you what that looks like in a real example. Um, so if we come over to BlueJ and we go back to our library, let's say public void print catalog 
and has no arguments. Let's scroll down a little bit. Okay, what we're going to do is say for um, for every book B in our in my in my books, and what we're going to do is say system dot out dot printlin uh, B dot get or uh, get title, shall we say? And we're going to have to add a get title method to that. To that, so let's go over to our book class a book class and add a get title method, an accessor. So we say public string get title return return title my my title. Okay, we compile that and we come over here and we compile everything. Oh, good, no no errors. So now if we create our library new library, library one, and we're going to add a book to that library, add a book um, from me, and then the book name is this, and we're going to add another book to that library, add book from you, and the book name is that. Okay, now if we call the print catalog, there we go, it prints out every name of every, every title of every book. Um, if we actually go back to, to that method, and let's put a breakpoint here so we can see what's happening. Um, and now let's run that again. We bring up the debugger. We can see, um, let me put that screen back down. Um, we can see now if we step through it, the first time it, it runs the list, the variable B is now going to be there's, so the variable B the first time points to the, the book this um, and we step through and we print that out and there it goes, it prints this and then we step again, so when we printed that out it goes back to the top of the loop whoops, where did I just put that debugger? debugger, it goes back to the top of the loop and does it again this time it prints out the second book and the third, and it goes back to the top of the loop again but there's nothing left on the list and so it's done um, so if I Continue that. If I now go back and that should have done. If I go back and add another book to the library, add book um, called by him, and it's like whatever, because that's a good book. You should read that. Um, and now if we print the catalog, we can see that the first time it does it, it print the variable B. Let's have a look at this variable B. First time it does it, the variable B is me and this. We are, it goes back around. Now it should be point on a close. Let's, now it goes through again, and this time it's you and that. And we go back around again, and this time it's him and whatever. So what's happening is that every every iteration through the loop, it's going to the next item in the list. Um, and when there's nothing left on the list, uh, then the loop goes back to the top, finds there's nothing left on the list, and so it's finished. Uh, so this is a way of doing some operations several times. Um, excuse me, my nose is itchy. Um, this is handy because now we can print, I mean, if we wanted to print out the entire catalogue other without a loop, it would be difficult because we wouldn't know actually how many books, we don't know when, we, when we're writing the code how many books there are going to be. And so this code, we don't need to know how many books there are going to be, we just tell it to do this until we run out of books on the list. And it'll do it once for every book. Um, the other thing to notice here is that when we, when we did this for statement, what we have here is a variable declaration. We've actually created a new variable. So we talked about having, um, we talked about having local variables. This is a local variable, but this variable only exists inside the for loop. And so this variable b, we can use the variable b here in the, um, in, inside the for loop because we've defined it there. Outside the for loop, we can't use that variable anymore. So if I come here and say, System dot out dot printlin um, b dot get title. It should, if I try to compile that. Okay, you can't compile while the machine is running. So where's the debugger? Debugger tem, terminate. We try compiling that. 
it'll actually tell us now it can't find the variable b, um, can't find symbol b. The reason for this is that this variable b is only defined in the body of the for statement. And, um, once we're outside of that, the, so the scope, as I said, remember the, the scope is, the, is the, the lifetime of the variable. The scope is only for the for statement, and when we finish, that variable is thrown away. Okay, so that's enough for today. We'll go into other kinds of loops and other kinds of collections uh, later this week. Thank you all for coming. Oh, one thing before you go. If you're in Comp 1400, there are some problems with submitting the assignment. I know about these, but something I haven't been able to sort it out. So if, hopefully we'll, we'll sort it out before the due date. Otherwise, don't, don't fuss yourselves. We'll sort it out. The, the thing I don't want you to do is don't email me your assignments. I don't want your assignments by email. We'll fix the problem and then we'll submit them online. Thank you very much.